नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग एंड वेलकम टू दिस नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू दिस सेशन अ जर्नी दिस इज इंटरेक्शन विथ प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर गुरुराज मुतालिक सर सर डजेंट नीड एनी इंट्रोडक्शन एज सच दिस इंट्रोडक्शन विल बी फोकस्ड ऑन हेल्थ हेल्दी एजिंग बट सम ऑफ द क्वेश्चन दे आर ऑल्सो रिलेटेड टू लाइफ एंड आई एम श्योर we will not just enjoy but we will learn a lot from this interaction there are many seniors uh, expert uh, scientists uh, they are here in the group we welcome professor uh, brigadier rajan who is professor of cardiothoracic surgery from afmc uh, dr uh, sunita girish uh, professor sn bhavsar uh, professor joglekar uh, professor medha deshpande and uh, Mr. Ravi Nathu and many others, we welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Health Sciences. Before we begin the interview, we request our head of the department, Dr. Abhay Kudale, uh, to give uh, a token of our love, a book, uh, which is very well-known book that way. But uh, this is just a token of our respect and love, sir. I request Patwardhan sir to say a few words, and then we will initiate this interaction. Thank you, Girish. Uh, I am sure all of you will immensely enjoy this session. I don't know how long it will go, uh, and uh, probably you will get exhausted, but he will not. Uh, you know. Uh, it is difficult to introduce uh, Professor Mutalik uh, in a short time. Uh, although my acquaintance with him uh, was sometime during 2011 when I was uh, Vice Chancellor of Symbiosis, I think he was a God sent uh, mentor for me. And although we met first time in 2011, I uh, trust. Uh, and you will uh, like what I am saying now, that we were spiritually connected much before, you know. <laughs> so, uh, when he met me first, uh, I mean, not only uh, it was uh, a very, very different kind of uh, experience, uh, and his life story actually uh, will uh, unfold uh, his uh, introduction. So, just to give you a brief introduction, he was the first professor of medicine who established Department of Medicine at Bize Medical College. Uh, after that, uh, he, he did several things. Means the, uh, today one of the largest association of diabetes, uh, having today more than 4,000 members was established by him. He was the first four uh, founder members uh, of Diabetic Association here, you know. Uh, first focus of research, we call him a model physician scientist. And as you know, in India, we are very, very, uh, we have very few physician scientists. I mean, Dr. Rajan is uh, another example of physician scientist. Physician scientist means those clinicians or those surgeons who are also equally interested in research. Uh, Dr. Sunita probably also is uh, presenting that uh, header, but uh, my early mentors, I rec uh, recalled, two of my mentors were his classmates. One is Dr. N.S. Devdar, who founded this school, actually, uh, one of the very eminent uh, public health uh, personality. And another person, his classmate was Dr. R.D. Lele, another mentor of mine, you know. And many of you may have read his book, uh, uh, 
uh, on Ayurveda and modern medicine, one of the iconic book which he wrote. He was also professor of medicine, but at, I think, Grand Medical College, not here in Pune. So at BJ Medical College, he became dean after the professorship uh, and establishing the medicine department, he became the dean. After he was dean, looking into his own uh, contributions at that time to the field of public health, although he was in Department of Medicine, his contribution for various public health interventions was uh, immense. And so government of Maharashtra invited him and he then worked as Director of Medical Education and Research, what is known as DMER uh, in Maharashtra state. While he was working at DMER, Again, his work in many uh, infectious diseases also, tuberculosis or malaria eradication, that was its, uh, WHO got attracted uh, to his work and WHO invited him. Uh, and first he worked at WHO office, zero office in Delhi. Then he was called at Geneva, WHO DG at that time personally invited him at Geneva. So he worked at Geneva. After Geneva, he was sent to WHO office at United Nations in New York and he retired as director of WHO office at New York. So look at the uh, journey, you know, uh, of uh, life. Uh, so he has worked in India when literally there was scarcity of antibiotics and many infectious diseases uh, were grappling our community. The infant mortality rate was unimaginably low and several challenges. Since that time, he established the medical genetics discipline in our country, I would say. He was sent to, uh, he was selected as a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University, where he worked with Professor Mackusi, one of the leading medical geneticists and he uh, learned medical genetics there and after coming back, he established medical genetics department at Bize Medical College, which now has grown in multiples. You know. So medical genetics department and discipline itself at that time was uh, really uh, unheard and very uh, innovative, very ahead of time. So there are several such uh, pieces of his life, which I have uh, known. And uh, I consider him as my mentor and I spend every year at least a week with him. Grish, he and me together have written a book called uh, Integrative Approaches for Health, uh, representing three generations, you know. And uh, Girish, just coincidentally, we are sitting in the same sequence also, <laughs> as the authorships in the book, you know. Uh, Dr. Mutali came from a very, very uh, small village and I'm going to start this interview, uh, sir, by asking you the first question, you know. You come from a very small village. Uh, on the, that time even these borders of languages also were not there, you know. There was no border, there was no Karnataka, there was no Maharashtra at that time. So he came from Belgaum, uh, uh, not district, he will tell what it was at that time but uh, uh, Ainapur, a small village. At that time, there was no electricity, there was no water, uh, no safe drinking water, <laughs> nothing, you know. But uh, his father, who again was his mentor, uh, and he will tell us, so just few uh, uh, your uh, pieces of information, knowledge, wisdom, pearls, from your reflections, what was that time? in the village and what inspired you to do something different? That's a good question. First of all, thank you, Bhushan. You have raised expectations here quite high. <laughs> you know, I was a village boy and uh, I think by hereditary I was a little bright in the sense that I could absorb whatever the village had to give. But the village had to give very little because there were not even books. Uh, all the books available in the village, I had uh, read by the time I was in maybe fourth standard, primary. 
my father was like a prophet. He was like a, you know, you have read Khalil Gibran's prophet, some of you? No? Have you read? Yes. Yes. Or let us say, Purvi Ashram Madhle Rushi Muni Asasana, that kind of a thing. And he used to be a friend, guide, philosopher, and counselor for almost every family in the village. All kinds of problems they used to bring. And caste, creed, nothing. Everyone used to come. We used to, our house was situated in Jainwadi, the only house there. And so we, we, he was comfortable with them quite a lot. And so this went on like this, but he had a very well thought plan how to bring up children. He was extremely strict about inculcating discipline. And I remember even at the age of four, time to get up, 4.30 in the morning. He used to say, Brahme Murte Chothaya. You should do everything at four o'clock. And then he used to take me to a village temple, Balaji temple. And on the top of it, there were side rooms. And one brahmachari, an unmarried saint, used to teach yoga to the children. And he used to say, one hour of yoga. Before that, we had to finish bath and everything. And then, after that, he would teach me Sanskrit. And not only Sanskrit, everything that is required. And he did it in such a way that, you know, modern upbringing says that induce curiosity in children. The curiosity to learn, to know more and more, because knowledge is power. And so he used to do that. Because he, and he said that one advice he always used to give. That is, even in MD, once, you know, I will ramble a little, if you don't mind, because this memory, I can't go systematically like a paper. <laughs> uh, but later, when I had MD, professor of medicine, I went back to the village and said, give me one advice which will be useful to you. I touched his feet, and he said, there's only one advice. He told in vernacular that never let your fame, you will go far, but let never in your life your fame should exceed your true words. And that was a very important thing. You know, you may develop ego, you may develop I'm very important, people adore me, people worship me, never be fooled by that. They are only showering love, respect to you. And they are magnifying what you have achieved. Because, you see, whatever we have achieved, Bhushan or me or Brigadier, uh, I mean, uh, all these things, if we look at the scale of the world, how people have something like Einstein or Mozart or something, we are little creatures really. We have not even used our full potential. So then why develop Garva? Why, why do we develop arrogance? And that is driven home all the time. Right? And uh, so with these qualities, with a little luck, the luck of choosing parents carefully, <laughs> so that was what enabled me, with no horizon, set a star there, what you want to do, work hard for that, no, no respite, and you achieve it. It is within our capacity. It is common sense. Given a fair-sized brain, anything is possible. If you are not diverted into side lanes, or if you don't get uh, bogged down in routine way of doing and, doing and being satisfied. So dissatisfaction, that there is much more, many more worlds to conquer. So that is quality by which you cannot stop progress. So that is what keeps me, even at the age of 95, ajaram arvat pradnyo vidyam arthanja chintayat. As if there is no death, you go on acquiring knowledge and earn legitimate wealth. Not wealth, legitimate wealth. Fulfilling your needs and not accumulating it. 
So that was my life philosophy which was driven to me. And I was able to achieve maybe by his blessings, by destiny, everything like this. So now we go to the next part in your life. You did your medicine, uh, you joined Bize Medical College. It was your dream to become professor of medicine when the post of professor of medicine was not existing at Bize Medical College. At that time he dreamed that he wanted to become professor of medicine. And then you went to Johns Hopkins. So please tell us, because these students are all... Um, Professional career development. Uh, how Johns Hopkins uh, experience uh, helped you to develop uh, the medical genetics uh, discipline as such? My first question is, what is the length of this based on, because the level of detail? One hour. One hour. One hour. Okay. We started ten minutes ago? Yes. 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 So we'll finish by one hour. Yes. Uh, then, <coughs> you know, the high school in our village, was hardly anything. Uh, it was understaffed, not having qualified people, and they, you know, that time it was school leaving was matriculation examination, and so matriculation unqualified people. That means who have failed in matriculation used to teach us, and they always set our ambition very low. For example, in geometry, they used to say. You know, don't worry about riders, just concentrate on theorems, you'll get 35% and it's a pass. <laughs> that time 35% was pass. And so we were very greatly handicapped with this restriction of education and therefore all this was home. My father was a self-made man and he used to tutor us anything. He said, if you have to learn, you have to first learn the art of self learning. So you can get any knowledge through books and by asking questions, not being shy, I don't know, can you please explain like that. So I was equipped to go to the medical college and I was the first person in Willington College I went, Sangli, because we were so homesick people, every weekend we used to come back from Sangli to Ainapur. So that time I had wanted to go to Bombay or Pune or something because I had already built a lot of ambition to go to the, have the best education. So for first year college, but unfortunately Willington College was a kind of a mirror image of Ferguson College run by de dedicated professors and from Deccan and they used to be Pune and Sangli exchange like that. So we had a very good set of professors. That is where my wings sprouted. I began growing intellectually. I made full use of it. Their library was amazing. That's the first time in my life I had seen so many books there. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then I was able to obtain what is called as that time first class, which is 60% marks. We didn't have papers like this where you can score 95. Everything was descriptive and they used to be quite stingy. So I was one of the five people who attained first class. And then I said to my father, I want to go to Pune because I had heard about Ferguson College as one of the best. So I went there and Ferguson College education was something out of this world. All dedicated Professor Karvez, Sirode, Apte, Professor of Botany and one R.N. Joshi Arun Joshi was a professor of mathematics and he used to come in Pagdi and Dhoti and, and then teach mathematics as if it's the music. So great teachers were there. So Ferguson College one year stay nearly caught up my all deficiencies of education. And then naturally the question arose, if I get admission and if inter-science was the barrier, you have to pass it into science. And that time, there used to be five first classes in inter-science, five out of the whole thing. And I was one of the five. And so that time, medical colleges admissions were, they used to take a time, 15 days, one month. But people who have got 60% and above, they used to send a telegram. 
admitted. Congratulations, like that. <laughs> so I received congratulations from KEM Hospital Bombay, Grand Medical College, and uh, BJ Medical College. So there was a big debate at my house, what is safe for me? <laughs> so I said, I want to go to Bombay. They said, you know, that time there were lots of Hindu-Muslim rods. Maruti, Sonia Maruti, there used to be a lot of having bells, etc. So I said, Pune is relatively safe, and KM Hospital is very near Baikala, and so you might run into trouble. They were very, very <coughs> solicitous about my safety, and I joined medical college here. And uh, of course, uh, there were very high class students. There was one doctor, N.K. Vide. You, you must be knowing that. He was one of the Karyakartas there. And uh, nobody could win a prize, first place or prizes so long as he existed. <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> Amazing ability to write with left hand. And uh, he used to talk all examinations, howsoever we struggled. And in between, I remember, Dr. Vide was, uh, as a student, was involved in RSS movement and he was arrested. So we all said, now is the chance. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, we didn't know that uh, the only thing he asked in the jail was Gray's anatomy and Sterling's physiology. <laughs> so he even knew more about it <laughs> than the entire. And so he came and walked away with all the prizes. And then I had a sweet revenge on him in jurisprudence, an outlaying subject in second MBBS, only time somebody has exceeded scores of today is in medical jurisprudence, I had higher marks. So this is how it went off. Then we passed MBBS. After MBBS, the house posts, you know that houseman, registrar, these are residential posts before for MD registration. There was a gap of six months. So in fact, I didn't have any financial security, and my brother, somehow the great difficulty was paying the fees. So I determined that on the first day of the result onwards, I must be self-dependent. So we were job hunting. I had made arrangements that where we can get diverse experience. I had a friend called Shilgikar from Cholapur, and we together were thinking, we were roommates also that time, and so I had arranged previous, before results, an appointment with Dr. Vishwanathan, who was the director of health services, an extremely sharp man, extremely sharp man, but he could not have clinical, well-trained students because public health was the most neglected one. It used to be considered very inferior. And so we went there. And uh, he, it was very curious, he, he was so very excited. Two fresh graduates coming for seeking a job in the Department of Public Health. So he, he had a strategy. So we went and said that uh, we want to do MD, but there are still six months more. We want to have a job with you. He spent the next one hour prolonging the interview to recruit us on a permanent basis. If you join me today, I will guarantee you, within a year, I will make you district health officer. You are bright students, and, uh, or you can take uh, at least a malaria medical officer. So I said, no, sir, we are only seeking a temporary. And then he said, then I have nothing to do. And we are get up. He said, sit down. We have one clinical possibility. We have a tented hospital of 60 beds in two or three trucks. And we have camp hospitals wherever it is needed, but that is in infectious diseases. At present, he said, Mangao Taduka is having a rage of a cholera epidemic. So you can join and have as much experience as you like. And uh, Sedikar got a little frightened. He said, no, I will go and work as a doctor's assistant in somebody, as an apprentice. So I jumped at it. I will join. Then he said, come tomorrow, and I will give you an appointment letter starting from today. 
which was very good. That means my salary on the day of the result will start. And so we posted there. I will tell you, that experience made me a doctor. I knew what is the creed for a doctor. And in cholera camp, you know, they used to bring patients as the patients developed cholera. It's virtually like a dead body being wheeled in. That circulatory collapse. And the doctors were old doctors, two other colleagues of mine. They could not find anything. They were hardly in, uh, hardly in clinical medicine. And they were hearing my mother say. And uh, I was the one who used to be quite skillful having our student days, quite a lot of practical work. We had 20 deliveries, each student has to deliver. And all the injections, intravenous, we used to do as to senior students. We assisted in surgical operations with the surgeon. It was, the training was very good, there, as, even as a student. And so I, was, I, I took command almost as it were. I was the leader doctor there. And we, you know, the moment you find a way and inject glucose saline, they would, as if by magic, a dead body would get up and this thing. And so we saved. We had tragedies also. Many, many patients died because they were almost brought in the bed to do it. And I remember one pair where husband and wife with a breastfed baby was admitted. Husband and wife died, but the baby lived. He was just, you know, immune for that. And uh, we spent uh, quite a lot of time to make arrangements for it to be looked after. And the revenue authorities, Mamledar and all, were very helpful there. So this was the experience. And then cholera epidemic in three months dried up. And then there was another epi epidemic of what is called as in diabetes insipidus. People will pra pass, refuse, urine, and they got dehydrated and sent secondary infections and death like that. That was a mysterious disease. Nobody could find. And that is where I designed only on theoretical basis, five groups. One tried to be with chloromastine, one tried to be with, the, without knowing all this, we had some notion of double blind trials. And then, so government decided that we must also have an Ayurvedic. So some top physicians, there was Thom Nayan Nanak, and there was one Veni Madhav Shastri from Ahmedabad, and they formed an Ayurvedic unit. And we lived in the same, um, uh, what is called as, there are British style Bangalore on the campus with three, and they used to do like me, get up at four o'clock, and have Kavya Shastra, we know, and all this in Sanskrit, Subhashita and all this. I learned a little bit of basics of Ayurvedic from them. And so this is how my, my father, of course, was an Ayurvedic physician. So I had grounding of Ayurveda. But these were tops of Ayurvedic practice that time. And that's how we came. So when I came back and did residency, I was absolutely the most competent person, student, to take that residency, I could get the most of the benefit. Then I became register, and then immediately I I was posted with my high marks under the best unit, Modi and Grant. You know, this K. B. Grant had come fresh from Boston <coughs> as cardiology training, and it was all very smooth. And we got such intensive experience that MD was no problem. But there again, fortune intervened. And there was a famine that time. When I was a registrar, a famine. And so government started road works near Indapur. And there were thousands of workers there who used to fall ill. So they were created posts called scarcity medical officers. So I volunteered for that. And we lived in Indapur. And during that time, I did a study on Indapur village of incidence of cardiovascular disease for my thesis. And that thesis was presented at the research meeting of the ICMR with Grant and I flying there. And it was, uh, they were all very excited. This is one complete survey of the village for 
prevalence of cardiovascular disease. And we had taken, Grant used to come himself and take cardiogram of every, and we were surprised that the incidence of cardiovascular disease in a poor village was almost as high as uh, this thing. And we were wondering, what do they, how can it be? Our conventional wisdom is that, you know, these are diseases of prosperity. And later on we found that it is due to focal sepsis. That means dental caries was very prevalent and that leads to coronary arthritis, small, and that is, in, and that is what we confirmed in, with Dr. Shah later in the Bota, in, in, in uh, Ambi Hospital. So this is how we grow slowly and slowly. And so I got my MBBS in 1952. And this residency, etc., was from 52 to 55. And at 55, I got my MD. And after MD, I joined. I was always interested in uh, not in private practice. I tried my hand in I had a consulting room on Lakshmi Road. I remember <laughs> all the streams of bicycles, one way like this. And not one way. It was two ways. And then uh, patients used to come, and uh, I, I used to get quite a lot. But one thing I noticed, I had bought a cardiogram machine by that time, and 20, 10 out of, 9 out of 10 cardiograms were all normal people. That digestive trouble, but say this thing. And then said, what is this? You make money out of normal people? And one occasionally a cardiac, cardiac uh, because they all used to go to hospital, PBS. So I got disgusted with prior practice and uh, looking for some full-time post. And uh, you know, I was so discouraged. There was one shake, head clerk. I always used to go to him, is there any prospect, some professor's post or assistant professor? So he said, no, government have no plans. I don't want to deceive you. And, and then suddenly, I one day ran into Dr. Dikshit, the principal, and I told him that I want to be a professor eventually, professor of medicine, it is my dream. And he laughed. He said, you know, this is for a fourth year student to say like this, it is, a, you know, it's too premature. But I like you, your aim in life. And who knows, it will be fulfilled. And so somehow or the other, government decided to at least establish one post of an assistant professor to start with. And so I jumped at it and applied. And uh, there were seven applicants from various grand medical colleges in this, and I was selected. And so that started the career. And then exactly three, four, four years and three months, that post was upgraded. And so I. And I, I was short of by three months experience. It, but uh, Dr. Srivastava was the interviewer. And he said, he has answered all the questions. He recommended that this man's this, uh, deficiency in that experience should be condoned. And he is the right man to be professor of medicine. That's how I got it. And after that, the, there was nothing, no setback. Four years later, uh, no, I joined at 59, at the age of 30, full-fledged professor and the head of the department. And then, and then, later in 1965, Government of India announced that every institution will give opportunities to train abroad for one or two years in specialities. So I investigated quite a lot and I chose medical genetics as a subject. And it's not usually people like cardiology, neurology, and all this, that so-called glamorous super. So I chose medical, medic, medical genetics was in its infancy. And fortunately, I, the only department which was prominent in that was the Johns Hopkins Hospital with Professor McCusick. And he is today considered as the father of medical genetics. He had a field practice area with Amish population. 
Amish are like our tribal populations. They don't, they don't even permit electricity to come in America. And but they are very good farmers and they intermarry. A geneticist's dream. And they keep their records. They have way huge number of children. Each family has five or seven children. And so recessive genes are very manifest. And in that, Dr. McCusick has literally 23 new syndromes he discovered. And then they were preparing a Mendelian inheritance in man, in man. And there he used to list heritage single gene disorders. And now that MIM MEM is become one of the most standard, they have, they have phenotypic description of 12,000 genes. And it, they are updating it, and it's free for anyone to study. Any syndrome, if it is related to genes, it is described there. And in fact, uh, it is so complete, Wilkins, who, found, who was awarded Nobel Prize for discovery of DNA, he wanted to look one day, and he told his wife, why don't you refer to Victor McCusick's Mendelian? So they looked up, it was there with full description. Then Wilkins, who had won Nobel Prize, said they gave the Nobel Prize to the wrong man, Victor should have won. <laughs> and ultimately, Victor McCusick got Lasker Award, which is supposed to be forerunner of Nobel Prize, and, and he developed cancer. But before that, Victor McCusick consented to come to Pune, and the first international genetics, in, in medical genetics, was held in BJ Medical College, for which he was the chief guest and he interested and inspired. And that enabled us to establish a genetic society of India. And uh, then, you know, Victor said to the future president of this thing, I said, no, sir, I don't deserve that. I don't have much experience still. And so let us make Sangui of Bombay. And so if you ask those people, my name does not appear. I was the founder secretary, and I remain founder secretary of the Human Society. And it's now almost uh, 2,000 2, members all over India. Similar things in diabetic. Five of us established a diabetic research society. Professor Ahuja of All India Institute, Dr. Vishwanathan of the uh, Tamil Nadu, and so on like this. And uh, now it has 4,000 diabetic researchers like you. So whatever I have done, it has a, for the long-term development, and that's the summary of my lifetime. And uh, I think, you know, there is nothing more to add about me. I don't, uh, I have not <laughs> exceeded one hour. Yeah. Uh, from your Yoga journey till uh, Johns Hopkins is fine. Now we want to know at 95, how are you so uh, agile, how you are so resilient, but that I will leave it to Girish. That is, that is an interesting story, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> all right. My father and mother were, had longevity. My mother died at 95th year and my father at 98th year. So the basic genome is of longevity <laughs> in me, but not all people in modern time even though you are born to longevity family, can live, survive. At least not fit, because our level of stress is quite different from our father's time. My father at the age of 92 used to cycle 25 miles to the farm, and we are chair bound, we are uh, peer pressure, do all kinds of things. Even I tasted alcohol and quite a lot. When I was WHO, I used to entertain all these international crowd, and you can't live without alcohol in Geneva. So like this, so environmentally, we are not in a position to perpetuate those genes. And now we know that having genes is only half the story. The genome is our heritage. But we did not know that time that there is such a thing called epigenome. The epigenome is the switchboard of genes. And many, most of the genes which matter are switched off one by one. 
and the switching off and switching on depends on what? Again, you, your dinacharya, what you eat, how much exercise you do, what is your level of stress, are you, are you happy? But not only just eating, drinking and sleeping, but what your thoughts are. Are you the type when you know everything are so sensitive and building image and riches, etc. You all know what is what is now called as Ikigai. Ikigai is a life philosophy. Why do you wake up in the morning? What is the purpose of your life? And all these effects determine. And then I learned it again by bitter experience. I was doing all right till 2019. And at 2019, I was writing a book. And deadlines in the book forced me to work from morning 7 to evening 7.30. When we looked at it, oh my God, it's already 7, 6.30. With a hasty lunch, you come in and then again start. And I had a consultant, no matter what he is, he brought additional stress by not following certain principles and so on like this. So as a result of which, one day, in the evening, and that day I remember I had also eaten Purun Poli because my son was visiting. And at 12 o'clock, first time in my life, the first disease, I got a massive discomfort. And I knew that something is wrong. And then, you know, I practiced yoga, so I practiced yoga nidra and went to sleep. And next day morning the pain had disappeared. So I said it may be a transient event. But when I got up and stood on my feet, it was something like a balloon which has a puncture. Every energy was drained from me. So I asked my friend, take me to a hospital. And I didn't tell him particulars, so he took leisurely. So there was a gap between the attack and the hospital attendance of 19 hours. And uh, when we went there, they discovered a massive heart attack. 98.5% of my coronary arteries were blocked. So the doc doctor who took cardiogram was a friend of mine. He used to attend my yoga classes, cardiologist. So he said, Why are, how are you away? Uh, alive, sir? With this, nobody can live like this. I said maybe that uh, Yoga Nidra I did started a little uh, communication between them, I don't know. But I lived in three year, three days in intensive care unit. And during that introspection when recovering, I decided that I will go to the very bottom of this epidemiology, why I got a heart attack and how I can regain. And I read every book on genetics, metabolism, cardiology, every article available to me and I decided that I will completely change my day-to-day -day living. And so after three months, six months, the follow-up study, uh, Dr. Choksi, my cardiologist, declared that there is no evidence of ever you got heart attack. No evidence whatsoever. You're not even ST, T wave inversions which are the relic of a cardiac visit. And then I started having a plan for me, I, walking at least two miles every day, not touching sugar, not touching, that means occasionally night. If somebody gives me a peda and say, which is my favorite, by the way, and photo <laughs> said, to me, Mr. Hale, and I won't touch. Why? Because our system inside works on neurological signals. So if I take a little bit of beta, the signal is sent that you are resumed carbohydrate dates. A carbohydrate free sugar. And then whatever I have done to recover my health is wiped out. So your good health that you see in me it entirely depends on how long I remain with a rigid state. You know it is nature has returned responsibility of your health to yourself. You can't outsource it to doctors. Doctors know nothing about health. They know all about diseases and that's so how you can relieve the symptoms. 
take it from me who has practiced medicine for 50 years. <laughs> so health has to be personal responsibility of yours and then health is very easy. And what age you start, it doesn't matter. The earlier you start, the better. But every one of you, ever since birth, old age is started. Every year the whole child is also there. And unfortunately at 60 or 65, people exhaust their, whatever the health ingredients are. They are called longevity genes. And the decline begins like this. At 75, most people have one disease at least. Diabetes or hypertension or some beginning of cerebral loss of memory or something. At 85, two diseases are in, invariably present. And anyone at 85 has no disease at all, is a very, either he is practicing genius or his genes are much stronger than I have inherited. And at 90, I have not seen a man who walks directly like me, even in my community. And at 95, most people are wheelchair or bedridden. So therefore, the message is, the earliest time you learn the discipline of living yourself and you really believe that health is the most prime wealth, you can, you can resurrect your health. And health, you know, unhealthy old age is not worth living. Because your dependence, your pain somewhere, your this thing, and then you all the time are centered. If someone comes to you for meeting your friend, all you talk is about your health. And then you are all the time fussy at home, your temper is not right and so on. But healthy aging is an asset because all the experience you have is fixed like a jigsaw puzzle. Ideas you go to, I, quite often I am surprised there is an abstract problem to be understood, complicated. Let us say concept of Rasayanas. And then you think about it and go to sleep. Next day morning a coherent theory, how it can be attacked to the extent basing on my knowledge. If I have more knowledge, it will be more complete. And so this is a boon to live alive in this age of discoveries and breakthrough. You know, 15 days a new review comes. You can't catch up. There's so much knowledge growing. And so this is the message that you can make your destiny. I was called here to deliver an oration. My main message was, what you reach your height depends on what you said. You are no slaves of your genes, genome. You are creators of your own destiny. And to the extent possible, that does not mean that I can become a, uh, somebody like Einstein. There is a limit to which I can rise, but there is also a limit to which I can fall because of the genome. Genome is still the central one. But how high you can take it, it is entirely dependent on your epigenome, and epigenome is in your hands. That is the final message. Thank you. Sir, sir we have time and a few more questions too. I have any questions. Yes. Sir, okay, I'll ask any questions. I will be, you will be told no lies. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, what tips you will suggest for all of us? Uh, what, what are the tips or what are the uh, message you will give all of us to remain healthy and uh, to live long? I already told That's what he told <laughs> Kirish. No, about diet and about lifestyle. No, because I told you what works for me and what works for me should work for you on general principles. Everybody is different. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Or shall I use this? Yeah. Last, last person. You can hear? Yeah. But yeah. this is for recording, sir. Hello. Oh, recording. Oh, I see. Um, humanity is so constructed that an individual profile cannot be duplicated by anybody. Each one of us is different. 
and that's why you classify as vata pitta kapha and then you say vata pitta atma kapitta kapha atma and all kinds of combinations you use why because individual profile phenotype that results as the interaction between you and your lifestyle what you have inherited and what you have acquired is very reaction is very different so the aim is to work towards your own personal formula by experimenting you know some people require high protein diets some people require oh no no some people madras is for example live in ever in eating carbohydrates rice 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 everything japanese do the same thing but general principle sir science has now concluded that vegetarian diet is better than non vegetarian diet but at the same time occasionally you requires supplementation of what vegetarian diet cannot give you namely say vitamin b12 for example vitamin b12 is not produced in the body it is present in animal protein and unless you learn to pick up i need vitamin b12 and foliates and therefore i should take it either through some vegetable sources or as a as a drug and so that kind of experimentation you have to do oh. and basic vitamin d3 is always required d3 calcium deficiency calcium is the backbone of bone health and no matter what you say in you know there is no contradiction between ayurveda and this thing ayurveda represents some total of knowledge gleaned through their own methodology tradition ayurveda most of you tend to treat as veda which is a mistake ayurveda charak sushrut and vagvat they formed the foundation stone and they expected that it will grow with time with so ayurveda if similar geniuses were born from time to time it happened to western medicine hippocrates was the originator galen wrote it so confidently so the galen's biographers you know sir william osler he writes that galen so read the meaning of medicine that 15th century stopped thinking about it until vesuvius they found circulation how we found the circulation of it that did not happen to ayurved so we are we are faith students faith 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 students of ayurved you know you do, dr patwardhan used to conduct a, conduct a seminar in bangalore i attended one very bright post graduate students phd students in fact i wondered at their intelligence so the first lecture was given to me when i went there so i said can you tell me what ayurveda would have been if charaka had electroencephalograph or this thing they were scandalized what are you talking charaka system is complete in itself one girl argued with me then on the last day of the seminar she came sir we thought about it you are very right so you know we believe that this is the last word it's a system in its own right to be stranded so what has not happened is bringing up evidence base to ayurveda and that evidence base does not necessarily lie in controlled experiments double end and using p values as your <coughs> prestige to uh, i saw two young uh, uh, students arguing one day oh my series has got 0.05 but your series no no a my series has 0.01 p value <laughs> so we use p values as prestige points or something actually the defective defective thing in uh, statistics is we aim at the median values so we expect that in a sample it should work on all whereas the secret of this thing lies in the tail end of the curve you know 32% of the patients get cured even with placebo leave alone ayurveda and so the placebo 
you practice medicine and say if one or two patients get cured, I have cured cancer. Like that. So that attitude should disappear in the students. They should have an open mind. Knowledge is so increasing and you should follow their, your ideal should be he. He is the best biomedical scientist I have come across in the world. So, have an open mind, integrate all knowledge. All knowledge is not proprietary. Western medicine doesn't own it. Why not follow a little bit of discipline and, and you know, their methodology? So, apply it to Ayurveda. But don't artificially prove. And for that, you have to study Western basic sciences. You know, yesterday I was giving a luck, and we have, of course, Giru, this Girish went through what is called as uh, uh, Gurukul with me for three months. And when he was telling some students, what are you doing in, in why are you going to America? He said, I'm going to work with Dr. Mutalik. And the reaction of them was, are bapre. <laughs> <laughs> so, attitude is open mind, curiosity, knowing your basic sciences. Basic sciences is not just Ayurveda. Even there, Ekam Shastram Adhiyanu, he doesn't know anything, said Vagbat, oh, oh, shu, 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 isn't it? You have to be multidisciplinary expertise in order to make some impact on science. Anantaparam Kirukkalusha Shastram, knowledge is so expanding that nobody can keep pace on it. So you are hurry in publishing with half-baked data and thinking I am mean, important, I have got hundred publications is not the right thing. Go deep in everything. Unfortunately, you have Ayurvedic knowledge, but no laboratories of that class. So, you know, you write a genetic paper mentioning cytokines, but you don't even know the existence of NCRNAs and what are called as sirtuins and all this, and that is not permitted. So, therefore, master Western science in order to take Ayurveda to the greatest heights it belongs to. So, that is the message. Uh, well, when we met uh, a couple of days ago, you mentioned that you are using Gemini, artificial intelligence. Artificial you are, intelligence. Yes, you, are, you are the person who got trained in traditional knowledge system and also you are now experimenting with artificial intelligence and many of the tools. Uh, how how you uh, think that what should be the future of learning and how these AI based tools are important? Artificial intelligence, people have different kinds of <coughs> The very different kinds of knowledge about this. You know, it's an awe-inspiring, but these are essentially long language models. The only thing about artificial intelligence is all existing knowledge is accessible to them. All published knowledge is accessible. So to get anything good out of artificial or to use it as a learning tool, you have to prompt it. The prompt determines how much it reveals. So, when you ask, it's an art, it requires several years of study to elicit something intelligent from it. Otherwise, it gives broad categorization. But, it's a learning tool par excellence, if you know that. I can make my artificial intelligence, because as soon as I open, it says, hey, hi Guru Raj, then it prints all the dialogue I had. It has got the whole thing. I have about a thousand pages of dialogue with the artificial intelligence. And I make him do what I want. And that requires a training in itself. So you have to lead and show them, walk through them and ask some simple. I didn't know, for example, uh, how compliment. There are three modes of compliment. You know compliment? Complement is the immunological Compliment. system yes. derived from the liver function, right? There is, a, there is a classical and there is a alternate and so on, three modes. And they act at various different gene level. 
and that compliment if you have to know you have to know as much as the last word in compliment but some detail where you are not understood you ask him he will give you like a primary teacher all about what is missing in your knowledge to understand the essence of it so it's essentially for me a learning tool but learning tool it doesn't reveal all the things on itself i can make you know if you succeed in getting a diagram from them that is a test for every conversation of mine it prints references and it prints the main important scheme of the article and to get it to that it your level has to rise so that is the way of doing it i use gemini because it's it has got graphics more than this bot chat chat that is but more artificial intelligence are on the way that is also in infancy a day will come when artificial intelligence saves all your labor of writing books etc and it's better to practice from now onwards you know my sister's son i let me introduce you samir samir is my sister's son he has acquired expertise in all these things media artificial intelligence and so on which is health we are going to set up a website with the resources to advise us like dr patwardhan and in that our aim is to bring high science to the doorsteps of postgraduate students or teachers so that is the thing is the future endeavor i am trying to do so let can any audience questions any audience questions to remain mentally active to regain good health most important you know sitting on the back bench you are asking a question it's self wonderful <laughs> <laughs> so mentally active mentally active persons do not develop dementia if you are engaging yourself you live in your world of thought rather than what is called as gappa gosti you know how is the weather kya dukanat kay milta kya dukanat kay milta instead of that if you have a problem you are engaging yourself that saves your cognition and memory so it's very important so that's why we advise old people at least you know you engage yourself in puzzles in crossword and so on like this yes i have experienced uh, his reading abilities he reads one book a day uh, how to master the art of reading how how to master the art of reading and fast no reading. no there are now methods for fast reading you know if you take a page half the words are written wrong d a and all these particles so if you can train yourself you know john f kennedy the president used to look at a memo and lay it down so the grasp of what is the message of the page can be within seconds and then you also know that some of the skim things you have skipped over so at leisure second reading or third reading i take a i read a book a so 250 page is the limit in about when i get up at morning 4 by evening i have finished it but i read the book several times come back to it and i look up what i have missed and so it goes on i for example i was reading a most fantastic book called as the code breaker isaacson is the author he has written also the biography of uh, einstein and this code breaker is the biography of a woman who was motivated ultimately she won the nobel prize 
by just her father giving her as a present, birthday present, Watson's double helix. And she says she was fascinated. Otherwise, her parents had already decided to put her in school of music or school of architecture or something like that. She said that time women never entered science. Science was not for them. So she then she became the most world famous chemist by having CRISPR technology invented. And how how high was her drive, how she organized her life, how she became obsessed with uh, molecular biology is a book. It's a very fascinating book. Every character who played a role in this is portrayed there, but she is the heroine. So that book I finished in two days because it was huge book like that. But I have read it, I have taken that book to read maybe about 50 times, like that. So, reading is a, what you want to get from reading, basic summary and then details of what is your work connected with. So, there has to be a plan like that. Any question? I am now 67, much smaller than you, uh, but uh, when I engage with uh, my peers or um, people of my age, most of them feel that um, I have done everything that, has, uh, that is to be done. There is no point in living. So, uh, for them, what can be the motivation? Sir, what is the focus? No, uh, see, many people, uh, you know, at 65, 67, mm. they say we have done enough now. They How old is he? He is 67. Okay. He is the one who did that Why the Scientist program. Oh. Uh, he is Professor Joglekar, uh, Ayurvedic professor. So, what is his question? So, his question is what is the motivation to live longer? I am done at 67, I have done everything. Yeah. Why should I live longer? What is the motivation to live longer? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the motivation is to say, I have not done anything, I have not even touched the base. <laughs> <laughs> and mountains after mountains are still remaining to be climbed. And so I can't say that I have fulfilled any of these things. What we have achieved is so little in comparison of what is to be. Uh, you know, there, were, uh, there, were, there was a Nobel Prize scientist. He wrote an introduction to a physics book. What he wrote there is, we are happy that the, that the island on which I am staying it is increasing. My intellectual territory is increasing. But I very never realized that the shores of ignorance are even larger than <laughs> Yes. And that is the thing. So, but this is the reaching to your maximum potential. Yes. The aim of purpose. I always say, ask yourself, what is the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to attain the highest potential we are capable of. And each one has a different potential. And then the thing is that means that you have freedom to do anything. Don't forget that there is no free will. You are conditioned. Physics, physicists believe if you ask your professor of physics from Pune University and bring him here, he will say that we physicists don't believe in free will. Everything is pre armed and that is the derivation from quantum theory. Our Hindu philosophy is a little better. We are granted a little free will and that is called as Datta Swatandra. You know, I can walk out now or maybe that I am, that also is impossible because I am conditioned to complete this. So, there was a Princeton experiment where they had colored switches blue, red, and then they said, you know, 
and they have hooked with all electrodes here, including single ray, single ray, uh, what is that, deep, deep X-ray, single ray cathode, cathode ray study. And then they said, you know, I tell you when, I want to press you one of the colored things. I'll say blue, blue button or red button. I will not tell that to you. You choose what color you want to press. But you make up your mind after I give the command. And then this was at Princeton famous experiment. <coughs> then they tested on a series of 25 students like you. And then Girish, now you can press a button of thinking which button you should press. Then you took some time and then you pressed the red button. And they found the signals in the brain that is decision to make, to press the red button was some 0.8 microseconds before he pressed. Eight, sometimes as much as eight seconds before. That means his mind was made up. The way he is brought up at that moment, interaction with the cosmic environment, his decision was made up. So that means there is no free will. You are a conditioned from beginning. So we believe, I, I once uh, at an Ayurvedic conference, I spoke on free will in, in uh, uh, Florida. And I said that, you know, if you read Bhagavad Gita, there's a little free will. And that little free will is to provide your highest potential and to bring you, if you don't use opportunities, to your lowest level that you can bring. You know, if, if there's something good you can achieve, but if something bad also you can do, that depends on your effort, what kinds of friends you have got, what kind of motivation you have got. So he is absolutely right. The purpose of life is to strive on to achieve your highest potential. Whatever that highest potential is. And there, so therefore, you have to think more about one question. What do I want to do with my life? Not, I want to be successful, I want to be rich, I want to be famous. That's not the motivation. What do you want? So that in your dying days, there is no regret. I have done all that I can do. Take me, I'm ready. That is the philosophy of life. And when you do that, you will attain nearby at least of the goal you all set. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, sir, I'm going to take a liberty here. I'm going to take a liberty here. Uh, I don't want to miss the chance uh, because many eminent experts are sitting here uh, of the dais along the lines. So uh, we are seeing your collaboration since uh, many years. Uh, uh, since last two decades, three of you are collaborating with each other. And uh, uh, we uh, look up to Dr. Girish and Professor Patwajan and uh, uh, they look up to you and ultimately we look up to you as a person. So, uh, both of them have spent uh, enough time with you, they stayed with you and uh, you shared a lot of knowledge with each other. This is not a legacy of only uh, thoughts and, and not only books and research articles but also the legacy of thoughts, wisdom and uh, knowledge, etc. So, uh, what it takes to be your student? Uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, both of them are, you know, eminent in their fields. And uh, the way we sit in front of uh, Dr. Girish and uh, Dr. Professor Patwarda, today they are sitting with you in the similar manner, being the student. So, what it takes it, uh, to be your student? Please uh, enlighten us. So, what? What it what it takes to be your student? What it takes to be my student? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, what are your what are your reflections on Dr. Girish and Professor Patel? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you very plainly. What it takes what it takes your resolve. I want to go and become your student, and. Necessarily because of based on circumstances, I will not be sidelined 
to leave research and take a lucrative job. That is what it takes. I know, I understand. Circumstances are such that you want to help your family. You, but single-minded ambition is not distracted by necessities of life. There are hundred ways of meeting them. So how high your motivation is, you can overcome obstacles in the way. I tell you, because the potential, yeah. but you know, you don't have necessary to do this. There are mentors all over. Uh, you can uh, you can become Patwarzan student. It's even better than becoming my student. No. <laughs> Does that satisfy you? <laughs> he he is in now better hands. Santosh is now his teacher, and Santosh is also a wonderful person. You know, Santosh is just sitting there. He is a clinical pharmacologist. Did his PhD from uh, University of Cincinnati. Oh, and came back all the way, uh, and now. Uh, Akash is working with him. Very good. You have found your <laughs> man. <laughs> so you are, I am very impressed with your motivation, your knowledge. I have read your papers. But you should not be satisfied, diverted from your aim. You have the capacity to be a very good researcher. Very, very good. And so find a mentor. Work on it. Any last question? You have found already a mentor, right? Yes. I want to add to that answer. Yes. Charak says, Krutsnohi loko buddhimata machagra. Shatrushya ka buddhimata. So, if you have intellect, and that is a given, <laughs> because you have achieved something with your intellect. So you are buddhiman. So you can learn from each and everything in the universe. You don't, you should not focus on one single person as a mentor or one single entity. No. The whole universe is your teacher. Akash, condescending advice from us is no good because there are certain circumstances. What can you do about American visa system? By, by now you would be there, isn't it, if it was straightforward like this. So don't blame yourself. You are doing the right thing, but don't leave your goals. That is my important. That's the advice. Okay. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I uh, rightly pointed out my Sir said it's a karmic connection when uh, Sir met you. And it's my karmic connection also. Um, two days back, Sir, you will not believe. Uh, you entered once one of my sessions where I was judging the session in Vijay Medical College. I never thought I will be here when I got uh, called from Tiru Sir to decide we had planned a small meeting. I felt this is a karmic connection where I can enter this. Uh, room and uh, very lucky to have some dialogue uh, with you and I uh, as a medical teacher left my uh, job in Vijay Medical College when I was at the you know uh, you can say height of whatever uh, all achievements and all that but I felt two important takes from your uh, session first is uh, get up early in the morning which I was feeling, uh, why I left the job, because I daily used to sleep uh, and feeling, uh, you know, I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do it complimentary and I didn't have to do it completely. Second thing, I am a practitioner of Buddhist, uh, you know, philosophy. I never heard of it. So, everybody was telling me, you are a fool to uh, pursue this spiritual journey, you are leaving the job. And I took PRS sir, at the age of 53. And now I'm here. I felt that the second important thing I which wanted to uh, continue, Ahankar, what you said, I just today I am here and I felt that now I got the purpose of my remaining journey. I'm very thankful that I could be here, thankful to Vidhi sir and Bhushan sir. Uh, it happened to be, just happened to be here and attending your session. 
So I think there is some karmic connection. And I just wanted to add how the spiritual, uh, this emotional quotient we always talk, how the spiritual journey uh, can uh, affect your energy. Because I always used to say last one year, I 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 used to say last one year, because of the stress. <laughs> so, happened to be on a spiritual journey. Buddha uh, practitioners are in there. I felt that spiritual journey, how it will help me in my aging process. I have, of course, everyone. Thank you, sir. So, that's a good question. She is asking how the spiritual journey is helping uh, in the aging. Uh, you know, ultimately, when you reach your objective, your reaching your goals, especially at my age, a spiritual component is the only thing that can fulfill the gap. Ultimately, most of our desires are based on material things. You know, it's all right to say that give up all your importance you give to fame, name, attainments, whatever your value system values it. But unless this, ultimately the path you have to do is to know yourself and to find out the larger goal of what is life. To reach, fulfill your highest potential is your goal. But why do you want to reach? Because you have to go beyond what human life is. Because life is connected all over. And to understand that larger problematic, as the French call it, the whole complex system, what is man himself? What is woman herself? What is the what is the ultimate? Why did Homo sapiens ascended like this, almost to near God? This thing. So these are questions for which there is no scientific road to climb. So that is spiritualism, where faith exceeds all reasoning, and it cannot be expressed in words. You may or may not believe in gods, but you have got to believe that there is a power that coordinates everything. And that is God, really. You know, I was arguing with a scientist who said, God is not necessary for anything at all. So then I argued like this, do you believe that there is a central organizing device in the world by which a distant object changes immediately beyond light years you know, Einstein's relationship between two particles, you know that, Einstein's time phenomenon. And so that quantum theory has almost proven to be, for some people at least, the spiritual pathway. Because it shows that there is an order and a universe and symmetry and beauty in all creation. So the scientists say that we are studying the clock and its intricate mechanisms. And we are aware of the thing that there is such a thing as a clockmaker. Things don't just evolve out of nothing. And but unfortunately, the methods of science cannot throw any light. God is a subject, faith is a subject for which science cannot analyze. It has no methodology. It falls within the epistemology of science. So that one is ultimately your aim to understand. What is Atma? What is Self? And some people have it and some people don't have that urge. So, spirituality cannot be prescribed for everyone. But if you, if you urge, if you have an inner inbuilt urge, some people have gone to the extent that there is a center of spirituality in each one of us and some people don't have it. They are comfortable with it. So, spirituality is ultimately individualistic. But the pursuit of it never ceases. And uh, you know, our, at least our Hindu traditions say there is a punar janma. Bahudaban janma namante jnana manmam prapadasi. You will understand me only after, warning, after being born several times, says Gita. And so there is the connection for this thing. And what you have attained in this life is not lost according to that philosophy. Because he's, Arjuna once asks this question, what happens to karma yogi whose journey is interrupted? All that he has done is waste? He says, no, no, no. 
Suchinam Srimatam Gehe Yoga Brahtopi Jayate. He is born in his next birth to give start from where he was and further climb. So this is the beauty of creation. At least I believe in that theory. Thank you, sir. Sir, I will say beauty. Uh, I want to also inform you that Mutani sir is a founder of Diabetic Society. He is a founder of Vijay Medical Research Society. He is also a founder of Pune Rose Society with Hindu Dietary. Oh. And uh, sir, what is the role of? You just understood. Yeah. What is what is the role of? our hobbies, interest and doing so many things in, in our life. You do this because you are bored inside. Yeah. You don't have this little bit. The hobbies are distractions because you can't keep the mind stretched like this. Once uh, uh, Isof was visiting a, a relation and uh, no, a relative has, was visiting Isof. Isof's fables, yes. very wise man. And he was playing, you know, marbles with his grandchild. He was engaged in a hobby. So he said, I am very surprised, you know, such man like you are. I thought you will be inside reading a book, etc. How are you playing with your grandson? He said, look at that bow. He had a bow. Bow and arrow, you know that, archaeology. So, I have not strung it. The thread is losing, is, is kept in the separated. It's not tensed. You can't keep human mind all the tense. So you have to relax because relaxation is a requirement for it to retain its strength. So that should be the problem of hobby. Hobby, hobby is not to kill time because you are bored with life. And that hobby all can be also intellectual hobby. It depends on you. In Florida, we see 80, 95 people doing lawn bowling. So it puts them in good shape, exercise as well as hobby. So hobbies are necessary. Everyone must have some creative hobby. It may be pottery, it may be painting, and it takes you another dimension at all. Music is a very good hobby, because music has its components also, spiritual components. You know, if you are if you are seeing that the dance which was set by Shankar Mahadevan, the three girls, Gajanan Seva, you know, you feel wonderful to even listen to it. Because their beauty, harmony, Nada Brahma is also part of the real Brahma, isn't it? <laughs> so, hobbies are a necessity for that. Asking the first question you wanted to ask him. What which one? first question you hmm. wanted to ask, he has not asked. You are going to ask you, what is your favorite Subhashi? My su su favorite <coughs> Subhashi? Subhashi, yes. <laughs> yes. My su favorite Subhashi is this. I, I read Bhaja Govindam quite often. And he has described old age. You are aware of it? Angam galitam palitam mundam dasana vihinam jatam tundam karagata kampita shobita dandam tadapina muncha tyasha pindam. What he is saying is, the old man, look at him, his skin is all wrinkled, he has no hair, all teeth have been knocked out. And the walking stick is, that he is carrying, it is suffering from Parkinsonism. The stick is suffering from Parkinsonism. It vibrates <laughs> like this. So still the old man has not lost his desire to acquire things, to earn money, and he worries about this. And that Subhashita has touched my It's not Subhashita, it's actually a real this thing. Charpata Panjari Stotra. Yes. So it was a great uh, and, uh, uh, thank you very much. Any concluding remarks? If you have any concluding remarks. Concluding? Conclu concluding remarks. Concluding remarks is have a star on the horizon. Until you reach, go on struggling. You will eventually reach. If not now, whenever you are reborn again. I believe in Punajan.
So it's not one lifetime where you have to waste. You know, ultimately it's tragic to have that philosophy. You know why? If you are here, you work so hard, all is gone. All is lost. You can't hand over to anybody. Howsoever close this happens. So there has to be continuity of existence. And that continuity of existence gives you one insight that your efforts never stop. Right? So that is it. Thank you, sir. Sir, with your permission, I would like to sir. sum up yeah. what I learned today. Discipline, humility, values, how he gave up making money and went after something else because of his values, dissatisfaction. Because it is satisfaction which 